So our next speaker uh, is the first of two updates from the Crime Service for England and Wales. First is by Catherine Grant. So uh, Catherine is responsible for the management of the Crime Service for England and Wales at ONS, including overseeing the return to face-to-face -face fieldwork following the pandemic, the introduction of the Wave 2 Plus telephone interviews and the development of the new harassment module. She was involved in the survey for a number of years at Berrien, is that how you pronounce it, formerly Cantor overseeing the development of the 10 to 15 uh, survey and the introduction, introduction of measures of fraud and computer misuse. So over to Catherine. Good morning, everyone. Um, so it's really nice to see everyone here in person today. Um, I thought I'd focus more on an update of changes to the crime survey since we've last all been together rather than going through the results. Um, I'm doing a quick through the very latest results right at the end um, but I wanted to leave some time for questions and feedback on what you find useful in the survey um, any areas any comments on the survey uh, so I'm going to do a quick introduction for the survey for anyone who's not familiar with the crime survey for England and Wales look at our return to face-to-face -face field work quick look at the CSEW results <coughs> and then availability, availability of the data because obviously that's what a lot of people are interested in um, so Crime Survey for England and Wales is a victimisation survey. It's got a long history, 40 plus years now, of measuring crime in the country. We're really proud of that trend data. It's really important to the survey and keep maintaining that trend underpins quite a lot of the rationale for how we change the survey, how we make sure we can protect that change, that trend, sorry, but also making sure that we're up to date and we're reflecting new crimes, we're reflecting a changing society and we're really sort of keeping up to date with user needs. Um, we have two main measures on the survey really, incidents and prevalence. We tend to lead with incidence measures, um, but the survey does so much more than that and I just wanted to list out a few of the other areas that we cover here. So we're looking at, as I said, incidents and prevalence of crime, the experience of domestic abuse as well, fear of crime, worries about being a victim of crime, experiences and perceptions of antisocial behaviour, crime prevention and security measures that people take, um, attitudes towards the police. We put in the questionnaire when we went back to face-to-face -face field work in October 2021, we've got a whole set of questions now on satisfaction with the police. So whether or not satisfaction when you call 999 uh, if you've been a victim of crime, if you've been a witness of ASB, um, all those measures are now within the survey data and I think could make it quite a useful, just a plug here, a useful piece of analysis if anyone's interested uh, in that sort of data. Um, alcohol and drug misuse and experience of domestic abuse, sexual assault and abuse during <coughs> childhood. So it's got a really wide topic range before just producing those headline estimates uh, that we publish quarterly. Uh, and come out. So thinking about that trend, the reason we, we've got the, the trend series is the survey's measured crime in the same way since it was first set up back in 1981. It's a face-to-face -face survey, collects details around how you've been a victim of crime by asking people living in private households whether or not they've experienced crime in the last 12 months. Um, it's used a continuous interviewing approach since 2001. Um, but it has evolved over time. I'm not going to linger on this chart because I think Joe's also got a copy in his presentation. Um, and it, but I just wanted to point out a couple of the, the main developments. So we introduced interviewing 10 to 15 year olds. Um, we've also changed to include a measure of fraud and cybercrime, um, fraud and computer misuse offences and those have been incorporated into the main estimates. So although the consistency of approach is really important for being able to see that trend line that I showed back here, to see that peak in the mid 90s of crime and we can compare back to that, it is important that we make changes as and when they're relevant. Um, so obviously one of the big things that we've had to deal with over the last few years, the same as everyone else, is we're suspended interviewing in March 2020 on the Crime Survey for England and Wales due to the COVID pandemic. Temporarily, we launched the Telephone Crime Survey, the TCSEW, and that was to provide headline estimates of crime across the pandemic. 
Um, but we were able to resume face-to-face -face interviewing in October 2021. Um, but we are seeing challenges with face-to-face -face interviewing now. Since the, re since the return to face-to-face, -to -face, I think this isn't something that's unique to the crime survey. It's affecting all face-to-face -face surveys, not just here in the UK, but internationally as well seeing lower response rates and increasing costs, uh, increasingly high costs of data collection using a face-to-face -face approach. Um, and largely, partly because of that, uh, and also requirements for larger sample sizes to be able to better measure a sort of geographical, uh, have better, better estimates at ge lower geographical levels. We've been looking at ways to increase the sample size and reduce our reliance potentially on face-to-face -face interviews. Um, we've also issued, looked to see a drop in response rates um, since the survey returned to face-to-face -face fields. So we had quite a nice steady trend line um, up until really sort of just before the pandemic we started to dip just below 70%. Since we've returned to face-to-face -to -face from October 2021, the response rate has dripped to sort of uh, dipped to the mid-40s. Obviously, October to March period, we were still seeing some um, lockdown measures in place, some, some restrictions around the COVID pandemic. Um, we are seeing a little bit of an improvement this year. It's, it's gone up to sort of the late 40s, I think, in the response rate so far. But it is a concern, and it's something that we've seen, again, it's not just affecting the crime survey for England and Wales, it's affecting all face-to-face -face surveys. Um, and we are looking at the impact of that on our data um, and whether or not we're seeing the increased non-response bias in the data. Um, that work is still on ongoing because we've only just sort of started to get the full year data um, and analysis to be able to look at that. So there's a number of reasons for the transformation, but partly we've been thinking about how do we transform the survey? How do we make sure it remains fit for purpose? Um, so we want to think about the sustainability of the survey. With the increasing cost of face-to-face, -face, we can't guarantee that we'll be able to fund the survey at the same sort of sample size in future years with those costs going up and up uh, exponentially. Um, so we're looking at a reduced reliance on the face-to-face -face interviews and also, as I said, thinking about that increased precision and granularity of the main estimates of crime. Um, and also modernising the survey with a multimodal approach. So it's a bit more respondent focused and people are able to sort of select a mode potentially. So we've introduced a longitudinal design to the survey. Um, we're starting with, we've maintained wave one interviews as they are face to face and that's so that we maintain the trend series. Um, we've introduced a telephone survey at wave two, so after tw 12 months after your original interview, we're back to respondents to ask them again, have they experienced crime in the previous 12 months? And then we're back to them at wave three, after another 12 months, etc. So we have no overlap in reference periods. That was the key thing for us in the design of wave two. Um, so we can, we can um, link people's data together. Um, and then we hope eventually, subject to success of the development work that we're undertaking at the moment, to be able to introduce an online mode as an alternative to the telephone for Wave 2. Joe will talk more about that, I suspect, uh, in a moment. Um, so in all our estimates that we're publishing at the moment, we're using Wave 1 data. Um, I've been focused mainly on the implementation of Wave 2, of getting it set up, getting the interviews in. And Joe's looking at how we then potentially look at combining that data with Wave 1 data um, and how we maintain um, the trend series as we move forward with transformation. So it's a brief introduction of transformation before Joe will talk about it shortly. Um, but thinking about the crime survey design for the 22-23 survey, um, I just wanted to update on a few changes that we made since our return to face-to-face -face field work. So we adjusted the sample design to allow for a greater flexibility in sample sizes. We saw increasing demand from Home Office in particular for um, 
uh, a boosted sample size and to be able to have a little bit more flexibility in the numbers of interviews that we were delivering. And so we moved away from the complex sample design that we were using pre-pandemic to a more simple random cluster design, um, which allows a bit greater flexibility. Um, we maintained the minimum targets within each police force area. Um, and the total sample size for wave one is reduced to around 30,000 interviews. Um, we introduced a new module of questions on harassment in April 2022, and we made some small tweaks to those questions uh, at the six month point in October 2023. With the harassment questions, we put quite a lot of, um, we looked we look back at the data that we had from TCSEW, so we were able to see how respondents had um, responded to a, a change question within the screener for TCSEW that actually broadened out the threat screener to cover harassment as well. So we were able to use that data to feed into a more detailed measure of harassment that's gone in as a, module, a new module of questions. I think what's important to note about that harassment measure is that we've moved away slightly from the legal definition of harassment as a sort of course of conduct, the repeated nature of the offence. And that was to enable us to capture sort of in-street harassment, sort of one-off incidents of harassment that people might be experiencing that might not meet the level that would need, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't count as a legal definition of harassment, uh, but is certainly impacting on people's experience um, as they're out and about. Um, so just to mention here as well, in the domestic abuse uh, module, there was an error in the survey script from October 2022 to January 2023, uh, which means there was missing data for 10 key questions. So there was full details of that in the user guide, but if you are using that data, uh, there's a new weight, there's an additional weight um, on the data file, which is uh, just listed here. Uh, and those are added to the data file for using that data where you'll need to use the eight months of data. And then in 2023-24, we introduced a high crime area boost sample. So this is particularly to reflect a Home Office interest in understanding um, neighbourhood crime in high crime areas. So one of the levelling up missions was to reduce um, the amount of, high, of neighbourhood crime within high crime areas, and that's being measured by the Crime Survey for England and Wales. So we've introduced a boost sample, so that's 6,000 out of the total of 32,500 interviews we're conducting on the survey are taking place in high crime areas. And those are defined using the crime index element of the IMD. Um, we've also launched the redesigned uh, questions on domestic abuse. Um, those are added as a split sample experiment. We look to update on those in late 2024, and they're planned to be on the survey until March 2025. Um, and currently this year, we're running the experience of abuse during childhood module on this year's survey. Um, so as I mentioned, all estimates for this year are based on Wave 1 data. Wave 2 is designed to be implemented with no impact on Wave 1 data. Um, and so we'll, we'll be fully exploring the impact of that before we combine anything. And then just a note on children's transformation. So the child crime survey was suspended over the pandemic as well. We interviewed 10 to 15 year olds within households who were selected as part of the main survey. Um, the children's survey wasn't resumed until April 2022. Um, we've seen again a little bit of a drop in the conversion into interviews from the children's survey data. So a drop in the response rates there of 10 to 15 year olds responding which has made us look to whether there's a better way of interviewing 10 to 15, uh, 10 to 15 year olds not connected uh, with the main adult interview. Um, so essentially that objective there is thinking about how we develop that efficient, sustainable and resilient survey, uh, which delivers a high quality, timely and inclusive data on children. 
Um, so we've been doing some qual and quant research, sort of looking at the feasibility of moving data collection online for the children. Uh, and we're looking at sort of a large-scale online response rate test launching later this month um, with a sample of 7,000 children, so sampling from the National Pupil Database. Um, and then pilot results will inform a recommendation for the future design of the children's survey with a view to potentially stopping face-to-face -face data collection for the children and moving fully to online data collection. Okay. So I've just put a couple of headlines here from our latest release in January on the crime survey. Um, so overall what we're seeing at the moment is quite a mixed picture with crime. We're seeing some crimes going up uh, in the survey, some, some going down, some going up compared to last year but not quite at pre-pandemic level. So quite a complicated picture um, of what's happening to crime at the moment. Uh, but overall fraud decreased year on year, 13% uh, of the notable reductions in advanced fee fraud. Uh, and other fraud as well, which is essentially just fraud that doesn't fall into any of the other buckets. Uh, computer misuse, though, increased by 30%, uh, and that was mainly driven by that 36% rise in unauthorised access to personal information. Um, and then criminal damage uh, decreased by 21%, and again, largely driven by a 30% fall in criminal damage to a vehicle. Um, there, were no change, uh, there was no change in CSEW estimates of violence, or that, um, bear in mind that doesn't include sort of sexual offences except for the uh, wound, serious wounding with a sexual motive, um, but estimates were still 28% lower than in the year ending March 2020. Um, so I've just, I think we've shared these, so I've just put the links onto our recent publications so that you can access them from the slides. And then just finally on the availability of data. Um, so the TCSEW non-victim file data sets are now available in the data archive. We don't have any plans to publish the victim file data sets for TCSEW. Um, largely that's because of the longitudinal nature of those data sets. We didn't have the processes set up to do that. It was a temporary measure obviously to run the TCSEW over the pandemic. Um, so we're focusing more on the archiving now. We've returned to face-to-face -to -face of uh, the new the new face-to-face -face data sets. Um, so the data, the 22-23 data set is currently in the final stages of preparation, should be in the data archive um, by the end of March at the latest. Um, we don't yet have plans for Wave 2 data to be archived. We're focusing on the face-to-face -face data. That will no doubt be archived in due course, but no current plans or timeline as yet. Okay. Thank you. Any questions?